focus on experimentation. Um, and obviously, big theme um, for many reasons right now. Um, I, I wanted to start off, uh, though, with, with this, this quote um, from um, sorry, we're not. from Charles uh, Eisenstein, uh, an author who, who recently wrote uh, this quote, which I think is, is a good place to start this conversation. Um, I have my opinions, but if there is one thing I've learned through the course of this emergency, is that I don't really know what's happening. I don't see how anyone can admit the seething farrago of news, fake news, rumors, suppressed information, conspiracy theories, propaganda, politicized narratives that fill the internet. I wish a lot more people would embrace not knowing. I say that both to those who embrace the dominant narrative as well as those who hew back to dissenting ones. What information might we be blocking out in order to maintain the integrity of our viewpoints? Let's be humble in our beliefs. It's a matter of life and death. So I thought that was a, was a fitting place to start to talk about experimentation and obviously uh, one uh, that is that a lot of governments and organizations around the world are being forced into uh, by this crisis. Um, and we're really happy to explore this, this theme and what's going on uh, around the world and what are different responses um, uh, in terms of experimentation. Uh, and we're really lucky to, to be joined by Giulio Quagliaccio, who's the head of the Regional Development Center at the UNDP. Uh, we've joined by, by uh, Mikio Anala, who's uh, lead at the Govern uh, Governance Innovation at, at Demos Helsinki, and Hefin Wong, who's the Director of Technology and the Director of Technology Management Office at the GovTech in Singapore, um, all, of all of who I believe uh, or I'm inspired by in terms of their previous work uh, over the years with, with driving experimentation in governments in, in, in different respects. So I'm, so I'm really keen that we, we, we hear from them very shortly. Um, before that, um, a few ground rules. Uh, we, are, we are recording this, which I hope is okay, and we're gonna be sharing this after the call. Um, the structure of the conversation will be that we hear from the panelists and we will have time for Q and A's uh, a bit in the main session. Um, uh, and please do share um, both in the chat and the working doc, uh, which we've shared beforehand share your thoughts and comments. We will make sure to try to incorporate as much as we can. Um, and for those of you that, that can stay on for a little while after the first hour, we'll continue the conversation having a bit of an op optional breakout uh, uh, to, to, to go further into to, to those questions. Um, and with that, I think, as we usually do in these sessions, we're gonna start off uh, with a bit of a check-in. Um, with uh, sort of a one-on-one. -on -one. I'm gonna put you into groups very shortly. And the basics of those, this check-in is just to introduce yourself. Um, you know, check in with how you're feeling uh, and share that. Uh, and maybe if you have time, share what interests you about the topic. Uh, and then after that, we'll, we'll kick it off with, with the speakers. So uh, let, me, let me just see if I can put you into a few rooms here um, and then we can get going. This works. See you in a bit.
Right. Hopefully you had a, had a nice quick conversation um, to get going uh, and you're primed for what's ahead. So without further ado, I'll, I'll pass it over to the first speaker, which will be Hefin Wan uh, from uh, Singapore. So we're really keen to hear how things are going at your end and, and what we can learn. Uh, so over to you, Hefin. Okay, does the screen look okay? Yep, go on. Okay. Yeah, so uh, my name is Hafen. I come from Singapore. I work in GovTech. It's the equivalent of the UK government digital services. And um, I lead the technology management office as well as the development and organization transformation office. I'm currently on maternity leave. I gave birth in December last year. Um, my daughter is about four and a half months. So I actually head back to work um, next Friday. Uh, yeah, so all my observations in this presentation is kind of like as a, a citizen and someone who's a public servant watching the crisis and the government's response as a bystander or outstander to some extent. Um, so I wanted to share five types of experiments that I observed. I, my sense is it's mostly unintentional because um, my definition of experiment is when you have a hypothesis you want to test and you're intentional about it and you can iterate your solutions. But in this instance, as people are really trying to solve a crisis um, in an emergency mode, I, don't think, I think most of the experiments are unintentional. The first experiment I saw was um, a global dance, like a careful dance that each uh, government is doing in terms of reviving our economies and protecting our healthcare systems with data-driven decisions. Um, I think this impacts the speed and scale in which uh, countries decide to lock down a place and balancing the act between the economy and the healthcare. And the sources of data that I can see countries using, is like um, the number of COVID cases daily, um, the sources of transmission, which gives us clues on the speed and the mode of transmission, the bed spaces, equipment, and staff needed in hospitals. And the, on the economy front, maybe the number of layoffs, applications for jobs, social assistance, unemployment insurance, etc. I think it's quite unusual to make live data-driven decisions in such a short time. Most of the time I see government using data in a um, more lagged data, as well as data to make a point. Whereas in this case today, there's more pressure for transparency and the rationale for decisions. So I'm actually quite heartened in a way to see how decisions have to be data-driven in this time. The second experiment I saw was um, the choice of essential services that our governments choose to keep open during this time. It reveals what is important to our economy and our communities. So for Singapore, what they choose to keep open um, it's like banking and finance, um, certain manufacturing services, of course, the essential health care, etc. We also keep food, deli food delivery as an essential service, online retail and all of their supply chains, um, and all of our food services open. Uh, food is very important to Singaporeans, and a lot of us uh, eat out and don't really cook at home. So um, 5 p.m. last night, our Prime Minister gave a speech to say that they will be reducing the list of essential services. And at 7 p.m., the Ministry of Trade and Industry indicated that they will remove confectionery 
and beverages, uh, standalone stalls as, as the list of essential services. And by the, it will take effect at 2359 last night. So between 7 p.m. to 11 p.m., Singaporeans were rushing to buy bubble tea. Um, is, you, may be, you may know it as boba. And you can see in this picture, these are like food delivery um, riders in their green uniform and people queuing up for the drink uh, with safe distancing queues. I thought it was a little tricky because I felt that the Ministry of Health snuck in this uh, restriction by reducing the list of essential services because we have an ongoing war on diabetes where um, the politicians try to ask us to take less sugar, take more complex carbohydrates, etc. So I was quite shocked. Um, and food, as I say, is very important to Singaporeans. So there was a mad rush um, for these desserts and sweet drinks. Um, the, the delivery of essential services is also being experimented with. It pushes the boundaries beyond just going digital. Um, lots of organiza organizations, especially the Singapore government within the public service, um, lots of people are being deployed to frontline jobs cross-deployed across um, government agencies. For example, um, we do a lot of contact tracing. So people from different government agencies actually volunteer to do contact tracing or to go out to shops to tell them how to implement um, safe distancing in their shops. There's lots of community partnerships in this time as well with nonprofits working with government and companies um, to support our migrant workers and lots of fundraising. And the third experiment um, I see is this crisis really shines a light on our um, cleaners, our teachers, our healthcare workers, um, our chefs, our low-income communities, and our migrant workers. Typically, um, workers who are not really seen and they're kind of underappreciated in terms of how much we pay them and how we value them. I think how this really reveals our values and the emphasis that we put uh, on a transaction-based economy. I'm hopeful that after the crisis, um, things could change. We could value these frontline workers differently, pay them more, or at least raise the standards of their working conditions. The fourth experiment I saw was the stories that we tell, the public narratives that governments choose to put out for people to hold on to hope um, during lockdown periods and to stay the course to see things through. So the Prime Minister of Singapore is no different. He said in one of his video um, speeches that in the face of this sudden storm, as long as we stay united and support one another, the sun will come out and shine on us again. And for me, I felt quite comforted um, by his statement as um, Singaporeans generally don't, don't speak in such a emotional way or, or heartwarming way. Yeah, and I'm also curious about for other governments and countries, what is the public narratives we put out and what are the stories we tell ourselves. For well, the fifth and the last experiment that I saw uh, is digital public services. So in a matter of days, everything has gone digital. Uh, lots of customer services are closed. People can't go to counters anymore. Everything has gone digital. And um, I wanted to share three products by GovTech, which I found quite interesting in this crisis. The first on the left, um, is some people are required to stay home, say after they return home from an overseas trip. And they needed a way to find out whether people were really staying home. So they would get personalized um, text messages with a personalized URL, and they had to click on it um, by turning on the location service to declare uh, where they were and whether they were really staying at home. This was also complemented by video calls to see um, whether people were home. 
The second product that I found interesting was um, the government started using WhatsApp in a big way. They encouraged people to sign up for a subscription to, to this chat service. And because WhatsApp is widely used as the dominant um, chat app in Singapore, so they use it to put out news every day on the progress of the crisis, as well as to combat fake news. So they can do this um, really quickly and it kind of stems the spread of fake news more easily. The third and last product is a Trace Together. It's a contact tracing product that was made based on Bluetooth, I believe is the first in the world. Um, so if you need to go out, for example, if you're in essential services, you're encouraged to turn this on and using Bluetooth, it can um, see who's around you, but it only works if the other people also have uh, traced together on their phones and also turned on. The data is um, saved on your phone and if you come into contact with a person that is later um, known to have COVID, the Ministry of Health will seek your permission to pull the data from your phone um, to do further contact tracing. Yeah, And my last slide um, is a question that I've been having on my mind. We are experimenting in the here and now, but are we putting enough thought about what is the future that we want and how do we build for it? And that's all. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Heaven. Um, really uh, interesting stuff from the, in many respects, uh, probably the cutting edge of this, of this movement, if you, we can call it that. Um, and particularly, well, you may said many things of interest that we'll pick up. I'm sure uh, you started with that notion of intentional uh, experimentation, which I think uh, is an interesting one, given how we usually talk about um, going about doing experiments in government. So, so maybe it's something we can return to as well. Um, uh, I'll quickly hand it over to Miko, who can uh, pick up the, the baton here um, and just share his experience from, from Finland. So over to you, Miko. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you, Heaven, for a very interesting, interesting uh, presentation. Um, so hi everyone, uh, great to be on this call. Um, in Finland, we are we are in stage of a lockdown, like I think most countries are at the moment. And for us Finns, the big question is the spring. Uh, we have a long depressing winter and the, when the spring comes, er, everyone tends to go a little bit crazy uh, after a long winter. So I can see that that can be a problem in the middle of COVID-19. Uh, I wanted to uh, I didn't prepare slides, so I hope you bear with me and with my Scandinavian accent for 10 minutes. I wanted to start by giving a little bit of background uh, about myself to provide you a chance to understand from what kind of perspective I'm looking at things. So I'm, I'm coming from a demo Helsinki, which is a Nordic think tank. Uh, we are independent, we are project funded, uh, very much impact driven. And we try to work uh, on projects that provide value uh, both for the client and for the society simultaneously. Our mission is to work towards more fair and sustainable futures. Um, we do this uh, with cities, with academia, corporations, but also uh, quite a lot with governments. Mm. And myself, I lead a team called Governance Innovation that works uh, with a variety of different governments and try to help them to be more prepared uh, to meet the challenges and seize the opportunities of this 21st century. So, um, so I think what I want to convey here is that uh, our work is very much hand, kind of hands down in a mud type of work. Uh, sometimes um, I want to emphasize this because the word think tank uh, makes you think of a research oriented organization, but we, we, we do that too, but we also try to do things in practice and see what works and what doesn't. So um, uh, first, I think I would like to create, try to create some conceptual clarity uh, by discussing uh, what we mean uh, by government experimentation. Uh, people usually interpret the word very differently. So I try to explain this and see if I can point out a few directions that I see important at the moment. Uh, one way to see government experimentation is to see it as government's ability uh, to prepare policies and laws through experimentation. So those who are not very familiar with the business as usual process of government, um, I, I guess you could say that policies are more or less planned. 
uh, they are not tested through action. Um, so you have a group of people, uh, they have they draw insights from the past research, um, they, they might interact a bit with experts, um, and if you have a big policy in large-scale policy in preparation, um, there is usually public debate about it. But very rarely governments, we test in practice uh, if a policy makes sense or not. Uh, so to prepare a policy uh, through experimentation, it is actually quite a delicate process. And if you want to get it right, it involves quite a lot of uh, domains of government. You need to kind of have the legal frameworks that enable experimentation. You need to have timely funding for experiments. You need to have technical skills uh, that enable you to build an experimentation setting. Um, you need to have a few mechanisms at place that are not usually at place in government, such as some procurement mechanisms and, and ethical protocols for, for running ethical uh, experiments and also some data protocols that ensure you that you can have that high quality data so that you can re draw reliable results. So <clears throat> I think uh, from this perspective, um, uh, we, we became quite uh, familiar with these topics when we worked a lot with the Finnish Prime Minister's office uh, around experimentation when the Finnish government uh, elevated experimentation to the highest political uh, agenda uh, over the previous government term. And then we started working with different governments on this topic. Um, and, and, and I think uh, this, in, from this perspective, um, uh, you could look at the situation in COVID-19 and and think uh, what, what would be the kind of value of experimentation in, in the, during this time and also after the COVID-19. So what I learned uh, working with the Finnish government uh, in Finland with policy experiment is that the greatest value of experimentation is that it can open up government's imagination. Uh, so it turns out that when you have experimentation in your toolkit, you can proceed uh, with moonshot initiatives that are too risky to be implemented. And you can do this because experimentation enables you to reduce the risk uh, that government has. Of course, government has a lot of uh, responsibilities. They are the ones that have to carry the risk so that other, we don't have to worry as citizens. And at the same time, government should be the ones that will be steering us through the important transformations of our, of our societies. So, <clears throat> so I want to highlight that this was the thing that enabled experimentation in government toolkit over the previous government term was the process that led the center-right government in Finland to conduct a basic income experiment, among many other experiments in Finland. So, um, so Jesper, I'd like to refer to your earlier speaker, Jeff Mulgan, who put it very well. Uh, so in this time, it's most important uh, that you are brave enough to imagine. And Personally, I think that if we come out of this crisis more or less the same than we were before, uh, we have failed. Uh, we have wasted the crisis, like you said, in the topic. And I think that um, if governments uh, would have systematic experimentation systems uh, in their toolkits, they could imagine better. Like uh, Hefen said in the, in the previous talk, the big question is what happens after this crisis? Will we be experimenting? Now we are experimenting because we have to, um, but will we be experimenting in the future? And I think uh, right now, having followed the governments and how, how they do policies uh, in, during business as usual, governments are usually restricted to the solutions that uh, seem realistic, uh, very likely and safe. And, at the same time, world is changing very fast, and sometimes we need transformative solutions, like the, for example, basic income policy would be in terms of social welfare. And these are risky directions and they might not work, um, but what is for sure is that some of the most needed solutions uh, come from those uncertain directions. So um, I think uh, that in a way this COVID-19 um, period, like it was very visible in Hefen's uh, presentation, it has kind of unlocked this gridlock for a short while. Uh, governments just had to act. They had to take risk um, because it was bigger risk not to act. I think very, very good illustration is the Hefen's last, last example, last experiment, which is the use of mobile data and mobile phones. Um, which when you look at the Western societies, especially it's a key challenge to our individual from the perspective of our individual freedom. And in Western societies, we have been avoiding this topic of government using mobile data um, 
which is kind of it's important to think that through but at the same time it's not in, it's not a good thing to see this as a very binary uh, or binary binary direction so now that now we start seeing that there is a third possibility in the sphere of using mobile data and, and digital platforms um, if you have governments like Germany and Finland, which are quite careful about privacy, uh, they are looking into ways to utilize Bluetooth apps to track when a contagious person meets another one. Um, and thus, this does not necessarily need the GPS. Yes, we start seeing that there are alternatives that the government could utilize. So I guess here what I'm trying to say uh, is that tracking people People per se, I'm not saying it is good or not um, in business as usual situation, but the point is that we have been very unable to explore those possibilities because they have been a taboo. So these uh, actions, they are actually quite far from, uh, sorry, they are not far from field experiments. What kind of governments have been discussing that we, they should start using field experiments in the future. Now they are kind of running them because they have to, but they are not so they are not uh, framing them as experiments, but in fact, they kind of are. Um, so my personal hunch on this front is that um, now that we have COVID-19 situation, it might motivate governments to put in place processes that enable uh, more interactive, agile, experimentative ways of prepare policies in the future. Because governments start seeing that these kind of situations will come in the future as well, and even if if crises like COVID-19 wouldn't come, we still have crises such as the climate crisis. It didn't go anywhere. The world is about to undergo rapid transformations. If we want to adapt, we need transformative policies. And transformative policies, they are really difficult to plan because they are complex. So with experimentation, you can move forward, test in practice what works and what doesn't. This is what we are doing with the vaccination too, right? It's just a very different thing. It's a biological thing but we don't put it out in the market before we know what, how it works. Okay, there's another topic uh, that I wanted to cover um, briefly, um, which is another interpretation of government experimentation. So the first one was something that I called policy experimentation. And then there is another one uh, called government experimentation. One more minute, okay, I'll take two. So I'll make my point in that time. Sorry, Jasper. So um, at the moment, you can see two narratives. Uh, one narrative is that governments need to focus in stopping the crisis. Uh, and the second narrative is that government need to see through the crisis and put in place new type of uh, institutional arrangement uh, processes and practices. I think it was you, Jasper, or perhaps Brenton, who brought up that UK income tax was originally a temporary mean to fund the Napoleonic Wars. And now here we are still paying our income taxes every month. I think this is a broader narrative, a very interesting narrative um, that um, I would have a few examples, maybe in the discussion session to share, share more broadly, but I'll share it now very briefly that we are working here in Finland with the Ministry of Finance around the meta-narrative of the Finnish public administration. And that narrative is supposed to explicate uh, what is the purpose of the government uh, in the 21st century and function as a guiding strategy for all the other uh, other strategies. And in the light of COVID-19, this has got quite a lot of uh, attention uh, already in the process, because now you kind of have the momentum that you can interpret what government actually is uh, in, in these times of crisis. And second thing, uh, very briefly, uh, we are also working with the Prime Minister's office in terms of new steering mechanisms of the government. And again, uh, if you look at the uh, Hefens presentation, we see that now the government are looking into ways of uh, utilizing the opportunities coming from digitalization uh, and, and steering societies and people through new means. But the very core of the government toolkit is still the same that it used to be in the industrial time. So now there is momentum that we are also using with the Prime Minister's office in order to look bravely into the directions where you could actually be imagining new type of policy, uh, in the, the policy instruments testing them in practice and see what works and what doesn't. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll quit here, uh, but I see that uh, maybe just in a nutshell, I see that um, uh, if we think it positively, um, I think there is a possibility that governments now take this momentum as a positive thing, see that it is crisis has been shedding a light uh, on them, uh, making them transparent. People are now more interested how governments do things 
And this could be utilized in terms of introducing new reforms and new processes that could be helpful in, in the long term. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mika. Um, really inspiring stuff. And, and I mean, really, um, one of the questions for, for this community, I think, is what we are doing in this very moment to hold on to those teachable moments for governments. Um, so it's not just becoming something you do in this liminal phase, but actually something that you can hold on to. I, I would have a question around uh, if we are not framing these experiments uh, as experiments, are we actually then capturing the learning well enough? Um, but I'll save that for the discussion and I'll, I'll also use that to prompt your, uh, the audience to share your questions in the chat or in the working document so we can pick those up uh, after Julio's uh, intervention, which I'll hand it over to you now, Julio. So thank you for, uh, for sharing. Thank you, Jasper. Can you see my screen? We can see it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you everybody. And again, thanks for the invitation to join the conversation. And thanks to Mika and Hefen for sharing their thoughts as well. So as a way of introduction, uh, I'm Julio. I work at uh, uh, UNDP, which is part of a UN family. I sit in Bangkok in something called the Regional Innovation Center. So again, the way perspective I come to this particular topic is being on the receiving end of the requests of governments that span from uh, Iran to Fiji, so a very big variety <clears throat> of needs and responses to, to, to the crisis. Um, by the way, I guess most of you have seen this, but this is actually the police in India adapting to coronavirus as the official guidance for World for Why. From this perspective, uh, I really like very much this sentence from um, uh, basically, it summarizes where we are sitting. So we are seeing a very different set of responses across the region uh, that speak to really different models of governance, different forms of responses, and also, uh, as Hefem beautifully put it, different values of what is considered essential and what is not. So this is at a micro, le macro level. Uh, at a micro level, we are seeing an awful lot of experimentation. I guess many of you might have seen this, this went viral last week. Uh, this is a village in Indonesia <clears throat> where the police wanted to encourage people to respect the curfew. And so they dressed up as uh, ghosts. Uh, one of the local legends says it that there are these ghosts wandering around at night in the hope of scaring people. Now, the interesting part of the story is that at least at the beginning, this had the opposite effect. So it attracted actually more people to come and see the ghosts. Um, but then after a few tweaks and after a few iteration of the experiments, if you will, they actually figured out a way where it actually had the desired effect and people kept uh, left at home. So we see this um, from the macro and the micro perspective. Um, Overall, I just wanted to reflect on a few themes. Some of them uh, have already been come up really quite nicely. Um, this whole distinction between forced versus intentional experimentation, where is actually the expressed desire to learn, uh, even if you don't have necessarily fully formulated hypothesis or it's just a reaction. And given the time of crisis, uh, you know, this reaction tends to explore things that would have not been possible to do otherwise. And I think a really interesting question here is whether uh, a crisis opens up a political uh, space to the imagination, if you want to use Mikkel's language, and can we actually afford the current forced experimentation not to already to transition, at least in part, to intentional experimentation, because we might not have this political window for very much longer. So if you look at an example, for example, uh, the spectrum where many cities in, in Asia as well, but uh, for example, in Colombia, have actually all of a sudden implemented pedestrian uh, areas and uh, enlarge them considerably as a way to provide space for people to uh, do exercise in time of social distancing. 
all the way to New Zealand, uh, where the government has actually made tactical urbanism policy uh, and created an innovation fund for cities so that they can actually, citizens can submit ideas and uh, experiments for tactical urbanism. So there is a broad spectrum all the way to, to Milan, but just yesterday actually declare that we're going to increase uh, dramatically the number of cyclable and pedestrian areas with the specific intent of becoming less, uh, more resilient to the next pandemic, because actually there seems to be a correlation between the level of pollution and the level of vulnerability to COVID. So I think this whole question about the transition, how fast we can move from forced to less intentional is, a, is an interesting one. The other thing that I think is really interesting to observe is uh, the distinction between, so you know, one of the things we often talked about when you're dealing with complex things is often best if you can have the ability to run multiple parallel experiments and eventually conceive them as a, as a, as a structured portfolio. Now, obviously, again, in time of crisis, you see quick fixes, mostly, but also you see interesting things. I'm sure you've seen it, but uh, Bill Gates famously has funded seven parallel experiments to find the vaccine on uh, COVID because it accelerates the speed. In our region, we just produced a small um, case study looking at the example of Vietnam, which has been talked much less about in terms of actually an effective response to COVID, but actually has a very, uh, what seems to have been so far, at least a very successful strategy. And on top of that, a frugal strategy, a much cheaper one. And one of the things that the government did at the very beginning of the crisis is um, in, um, call three different institutes and get them to, in parallel, try three different strategies to get to strong low-cost test kits um, and tweak the budgets so that they actually the money that typically would not be able to be dispersed across three different institutions could actually be uh, dispersed. Uh, and this has resulted in them uh, developing very quickly a low-cost um, testing mechanism that does, and Vietnam, I think, is it's already on its third or second straight day without a, a, a case right now. So, and then you move all the way, obviously, to more sophisticated things like portfolios, and an interesting thing to watch, for example, is um, South Korea is the first country that has had a COVID election and has doubled down after the uh, uh, victory of a, a majority part, uh, government has actually doubled down on its pledge to a new green growth, green deal. And is that going to be structured like a normal, uh, quote unquote, policy, the way that uh, Mika was describing it, or is there going to be actually an attempt at, at carrying over this experimentation uh, belief and maybe carrying it as a portfolio of experiments? That's going to be an interesting one to watch. Um, one of the things that has been quite interesting to uh, observe is where the experimentation happens and how much of the experimentation happens within government and how much happens beyond, uh, run and driven by citizens. Um, so again, if you look at the examples of uh, how South Korea and Taiwan were able to quickly um, develop new equipment, uh, was because they tweaked their procurement so that they could promise mass purchase of a number of different essential equipments, and this encouraged the private sector to come in. Um, a very much purposeful approach to that. Uh, but of course, what we've seen is an extraordinary amount of experimentation coming from citizens, self-organizing wherever the public services fail. And if there is one thing that we have noticed is that the interface between these two worlds uh, is still not as effective as we would have liked. So there is lots of bottom-up experimentation that doesn't translate or easily into a world of government. Um, and there is not an easy way for uh, citizens and governments to collaborate under that respect. A point which might be a more um, controversial one, I don't know who people think about it, but it just struck me. So when you look at the experience of Asian countries, you know, everybody has said, well, you know, one major advantage is that they had still memory from SARS. And there is also a very interesting case in, in Kerala, in India, of a state that uh, had initially a major spike in, in uh, cases, but was able to bring it under control very quickly. And this is a state where they had an encephalitis crisis a few years back. And what happened in all these cases is that there were fairly established protocols that were able to be kicked, um, uh, deployed 
Um, now, in this case, actually, we didn't need to experiment in some ways. So obviously, COVID is very different and unprecedented from any of the other crises that we saw before. But the really interesting question here is, is better organizational memory actually reduce the need for experimentation, at least in some cases? Um, and I'm reminded of Jeff's comment in one of our first presentations, where he was saying that most of the people that went through uh, pandemic response training in the UK government had already left when uh, uh, COVID struck and, and uh, creating a gap in that sense. And so memory, of course, is one thing, and the other thing is, is uh, organizational muscle. And so obviously, the more uh, infrastructure capabilities a government have, uh, the more options for experimentation it has. Uh, and so, you know, the fact that India was able to repurpose 10,000 train coaches to become ambulances is because they have this massive infrastructure that they can, uh, railway infrastructure that they can build on. Uh, same thing, for example, for, for Taobao Lai, which in China kept the farmers, basically the supply chain going, even in, uh, in times of uh, disruption, that could have been very, very uh, critical. So the last two points I would make very quickly, but obviously I think uh, what is coming up very strongly for, in all different levels, is the ethics uh, around many of these experiments. We already talked about data, privacy, and some other really profound questions around where the experiments are being conducted. You probably have seen these very controversial comments from a couple of French scientists saying that we should be experimenting new treatments in, uh, in Africa. Uh, and this has caused uh, a major uproar, understandably. And so, but you know, even if you don't need to go to that public state level statement is actually are the most vulnerable communities uh, where intentionally or unintentionally experimentation is going on, for example, when it comes to privacy or tracing. Uh, question marks, uh, which obviously all the governments are facing uh, at the moment. And the final thing I wanted to make, this I think is a point that came out in previous conversations as well. Um, if there is one thing which is not uh, uh, happening as much as we would have uh, liked to see is government to government peer learning. So experimentation, right? So if you take, you know, the value, constant variable is Corona and, and then we, everything that is happening around all these experiments, what is not happening uh, or is happening rather in a structured way is the level of shared of learning, uh, which is obviously something that at least from our end, we're really keen to promote. So we're actually organizing a small summit, uh, online summit in a couple of weeks to get peer to peer learning across different governments. At the end with one thing, a shameless plug, which is uh, how do we capture these uh, thoughts around the experimentation and as it happens and not afterwards when everything looks like a beautiful case study. Uh, so we actually take an astronomy leaf from Martin who published this beautiful blog post on an evaluation dividend. We're starting to do interviews with people who are at the front line of a COVID response in different governments and try to capture the nuggets and the dilemmas that drive some of this experimentation at the moment. And I'm really keen to, to see and hear from more stories uh, and, and compare notes because one of the things that we're really keen on is not to, uh, to try to capture at least some of the learning that is happening all around us. And this, I'll end it here. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Julio. Um, great stuff. And, and we can certainly share that last intent around uh, the peer-to-peer -peer sharing. Uh, and obviously a part of the, these conversations is to at least get some of those conversations going um, and so I, I see that people are starting to, to click in questions, which is great. Um, I will just initiate uh, maybe with a question actually from last week's session uh, where we talked about leadership. Um, and one of the questions there was um, particularly around, um, well, relating to government legitimacy. So usually we talk about experimentation um, in relation to, well, you need to have a sort of a high risk, uh, well, a tolerance for, for, for errors, um, a tolerance for taking risks. Um, and usually you want to create a space, I guess, where, um, uh, well, there's a sense of security about, you know, we're going to try this thing out, but it, it's in with, within kind of a, a conditioned or constrained space. Whereas now, as you were saying, you know, we have these mass experiments, experimental efforts with basically everything at stake. Um, and I'm wondering just quickly on your, on your thoughts on, on what that means for, for government legitimacy. Um, 
And, you know, is it a positive or what are the, some of the risks or the concerns we should have? Um, I mean, you can look at the U.S. as, as one example of, of concern where, where government seems to be getting away with things at, at the moment as well. Um, so what, do you have some considerations on that um, and, and, how, how, and how we should cope? Miko, I'll start with you. Yeah, thank you. I think it's a very, very interesting question. Uh, so, uh, what I what I've been uh, interpreting also in discussions with different governments that in in many many societies, if not all, uh, it, it has been shedding a light on how governments, uh, not only what governments do, but how they actually do things. Um, and when we have been looking more carefully in some governments that are closer by us here in Finland, we have been seeing that not that many processes and structures and preparatory measures were not at place and governments didn't look uh, as good as they, they would have wanted to look in the middle of this crisis. Uh, at the same time, the positive sign has been that when the crisis came, uh, governments were the ones that we were looking uh, towards to. So that would give them legitimacy to improve uh, their processes uh, and, and be more prepared for the, for the other challenges that are coming up. So I think, um, but the time will of course tell uh, one direction is that uh, society in societies where you don't have kind of the ventilation function uh, where you have for example um, uh, uh, strong leadership and if you don't cope well with this situation i think then my my one hunch is that that might be a very challenging situation uh, but the positive direction then again is that if you if you utilize this momentum you can actually improve and strengthen the legitimacy uh, of the government Anything to add happen, Julio? Yeah, it's a it's a difficult one, Jesper. I don't. I think we um, there is a, you know one of the easy analysis or things that is going around is this distinction between how authoritarian states versus more quote unquote democratic state responding to a crisis, um, and I don't think there is a you know. A, the verdict is out and whether that is even a useful way to look at it or whether actually this is a red herring and we should be looking at the basic mechanism in which legitimate interest has been developed. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed throughout, however, is that uh, in this particular crisis, in any crisis, I guess, but in this particular one, the role of communication and misinformation and the tension between these two seems to be played really particularly important role in this discussion around legitimacy and trust. Uh, and so, and I think one of the, if anything, what it has highlighted is that in that the battle for legitimacy, the, the tools that government have when it comes to uh, try to communicate uh, and reduce the level of misinformation are still not necessarily, not across the board anyway, really up for, for the task. Uh, and I suspect this is going to be a major focus moving forward. Right. Um, for Singapore, I think the legitimacy of the government is high because it's generally a high performing government and it's also a one political, one main political party system. And we are also a small city that's also a state and a country. So we, we can implement things a lot more easily compared to large countries. Um, I think the legitimacy of a government depends on the structure of the economy and the context of it. So in Singapore, a lot of things are state-led, government-led, whereas say in the U.S., um, businesses play a dominant role um, and foundations as well. So for example, in my last slide, I showed that we have a WhatsApp channel in Singapore where government puts out the news and is viewed as a legitimate source of information. Whereas you compare that to Trump, where it's not really a reliable source of information. And um, what I see on, say, Instagram, a lot of people putting out news in the US um, comes from like influencers online and people taking advice from them. So I thought it was a very um, 
interesting um, different behaviors depending on the context in which we live in. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of questions now coming in around the uh, uh, relating to public participation um, and particularly um, how to ensure um, in inclusiveness when it comes to the experiment. So how do we actually build experiments to cater or to kind of uh, make sure that we are um, kind of involving the, the more vulnerable uh, parts of the population, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously, uh, in, in, a, in a way, the crisis is putting everything on the line for that particular population. Do you have any thoughts or examples on, uh, uh, and maybe also connecting to your point, Julio, around kind of this, this sort of citizen entrepreneurial versus the government entrepreneurial, maybe there's a link up there. Uh, do you have any sort of examples, thoughts on uh, good ways of doing public participation um, in this time of crisis, um, sort of experiments that's done that well? Or, you know, any thoughts there? Um, no, that's a short answer, or rather I need to think about it, but um, let me tell you one thing which we had a number of different conversations at the moment. So one of the interesting questions, uh, for us obviously a big question is uh, identifying people that are most vulnerable uh, and how to actually empower them to take action closer to where they are. Um, so under the principle that a distributed system is more resilient to one that has a centralized choke point, right? Um, so, you know, one of the things that we are trying to discuss, but so far didn't have too much success, but it doesn't mean that there are not examples because I've seen it, I just need to think about it, right? So uh, at the moment, our standard way of understanding uh, this would be to run a survey, some kind of social impact assessment, whatever the data is collected is sent to some planner, whether at the local level or at the national level, and then they decide what to take action, right? So nothing wrong with that, but the really interesting question is, can you actually collect information and, and um, share it back to the people that uh, do, uh, uh, have actually provided it so that they can take more informed action locally? Uh, and what does that actually look like? So, you know, the example I always make is uh, poverty stoplight that has reverse engineered in Paraguay uh, household surveys so that actually poverty data is useful to poor people uh, and not only to government plan. And part of the result of doing that is that they get more accurate data because poor people have an interest in actually providing some of the data. So what is the equivalent of that for the situation that we are in now? There are ways in which information can be uh, pushed down uh, in, to, uh, sent back to the people who actually need it the most so that they can actually self-organize. Uh, that is a question that we are proactively exploring at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Other thoughts? If I may, if, if I may comment just briefly, um, also responding to the questions on policy experiments implementation models, I think these are a little bit combined. Uh, so basically, um, I, I see this, this question as um, partly as a protocol question. So if you don't have a protocol at place in government and you're experimenting, then you are more likely to do quick, uh, quick turns and then you usually uh, forget uh, participation. And the participation is always an upfront cost that you need to take, but when you do it, you reduce complexity and you in, increase trust and so forth. So if people are interested, um, we've been working on, in Finland, we've been working on an experimentation model that is very much based on the, on the participation and kind of the human-centric approach on that. Um, and, and there are other ex examples as well that participation has been kind of written into the uh, algorithm on how, how governments do experimentation. Any stuff? Anything to add happen? Or Oh, um, yeah. I think in terms of engaging the community in exper citizen-led experimentation, I think what's interesting is um, because it's so, the crisis is so large and it's so hard for the, for the government to support everyone, a lot of fundraising has come up. So in Singapore, the government has given out um, assistance funds uh, to everyone and it encourages people who don't need it to donate. 
um, to more vulnerable communities. And there are also lots of um, campaigns and initiatives to help the more vulnerable groups, which I've not seen in Singapore before, because usually the government does a lot on its own. And I think it helps people be more intentional and more aware of um, the communities that we have in Singapore. Brilliant. So I'm mindful of time. Uh, I'm going to do a quick kind of intervention now, um, given that we're almost at the end of the first hour. Um, as mentioned in the beginning, we'll have a bit more time to dive into questions, uh, and I hope that most of our speakers can, can keep on the call as well. Uh, and just as a teaser, we will be starting, uh, encouraged by Miko, with, with periods, a question around um, uh, how we would carry over this legitimacy to non-crisis times and hold on to, um, uh, and, and kind of what the tools and mechanisms in government are for doing that. Um, but uh, before I do, we jump into that, I'll, let me just reshare my screen uh, and share a bit of information. Um, So as I say, if you're staying, um, we, we have further questions for the, for the, for the panel. Uh, and if you're leaving us, thank you so much for, for joining. And we'll see you next week. Uh, and just as a, as a teaser for that next week, we will be talking kind of uh, about more futures related stuff, uh, um, particularly um, uh, focusing on how, how kind of futures uh, methods and, and approaches it can be useful in, in times like these as well. We will have Noah, Noah Rayford and, and a giant from Superflux uh, joining us then. So, so if nothing else, uh, look out for the sign-up details for that. But if you're staying around, uh, we'll, have, we'll give you one minute pause to reflect, uh, and then we'll continue the, the conversation. So thank you all for, for joining. Right, we'll ease our way further into the, to the conversation and I'll pick up with the, with the question from Pirat. Um, let me just see if I can bring that up again. So, so she's saying crisis clearly creates the legitimacy to in, intentionally or unintentionally to experiment. How would you carry this legitimacy over to non-crisis times or at least to a time where urgency is not generally accepted? What would be the tools or mechanisms in government for that? Um, so I think that's a, that's a really practical, kind of practically focused question. So curious about your thoughts on that. May I, may I start? Yeah, go on. Um, so this is, this is something that interests me the most at the moment. Um, I think there has been a pressure to rethink government processes for a while already. Everyone who has been working in the field uh, of government innovation knows this very well. Um, and I think one of the key messages from Julia was that um, there is a window of opportunity, political window of opportunity to renew things now. And, and how long is it open is the question. Um, I, I, I would like to think this in a very big, big picture that if you look at the uh, institutions like United Nations and, and well, EU, uh, OECD, and so forth. They were all basically established after a crisis, uh, more or less. World Economic Forum as well. Um, if that is true, then considerable part of our world order is has been created after a crisis. And I think kind of this sets an more or less an imperative for us to think big now. This doesn't mean that things will happen now. This doesn't mean that things will go into a certain good direction but it does open the window of opportunity and i think this is what your serious talks are about basically all of these episodes so in, by coming back to the Pirates question um, i think the anatomy of crisis goes so that you have to imagine now you have to experiment next and then when we are starting to recover from the crisis we would already need to be ready to implement and that is 
uh, kind of the mechanics that we should be looking into now. Uh, what type of, if we already know from the past, governments need to start experimenting, government need to start considering long-term approaches in their policy making, government need to be more agile and be more ready for under the risks that they are facing. If we already have ideas about this, I think the bigger question is how do we tap into the political momentum that we have at the moment and push through those reforms and what is the mechanism of preparing this so that we are timely uh, in this when we start to recover. Thank you. Further thoughts on that question, Heffen, Julio? Well, I think part of the uh, thing that is interesting to, will be interesting to see is what is the narrative about what constitutes a successful response to COVID? Um, is it the health, the uh, number of cases going down, or is it overall the repercussions on all the cascading effects, health, economy, et cetera, right? And under the assumption that this is going to be a long emergency, not a short one. And I think a battle of legitimacy is going to be built around what narrative, which aspect, right? So if you look at the moment, the big thing is where, we, you know, everybody's obsessed by charts and looking where the cases go down. Uh, but, uh, you know, economic impacts are starting to become really very quickly felt. I think we're just at the beginning of seeing the repercussions, right? So whether you look at the domestic violence cases going up, uh, whether you look at the impact on refugees, whether you're looking at all these other cascading effects, uh, is a government that has legitimacy moving forward, one that has been able to stem the crisis and reduce the number of cases, or one that actually has been able to put in place mechanisms to understand, cope, reduce, create new possibilities around these cascading effects. Uh, and I think the second question obviously is a much more complicated one. Uh, and it speaks to a number of different uh, ways to think about this, right? Uh, and, and that to me is a really interesting one. Uh, so I just read an article this morning that the German government seems to be the only one that has based the decision on whether to reopen the economy on a committee which includes an ethicist a historian of Christian religion uh, and a couple of other uh, uh, human science, uh, social science experts, right? Um, and, and I think that's really a really interesting one, right? So it is, is what are the considerations that are taken into account? What are the lenses that we bring? And this will also define eventually the type of uh, experimentation that we want to see moving forward, which goes beyond just the health impact, but all the other aspects that are related to it. Great, brilliant. Well, I think that um, governments are probably having some trauma in the system for having to implement changes so quickly on a daily basis. Um, policies that take a long time to create are probably made in one day, two days now. So my sense is after the crisis, um, the government may also take time to recover emotionally as people may be burnt out and what type of experiments it will do, um, what type of competencies it would then have after the crisis and how it uses these new skills um, it could be tied to the emotional state of the public service as well then. Great. Thank you, Heaven. Um, there's certainly a, a point which we were discussing previously as well around, um, to your point, Julio, about the, the um, let's say, the flavor that, that the data gets or the, the, the lenses, as you, as you say, how do we actually interpret the data and who gets to interpret what, what good uh, looks like uh, and how holistic or how uh, and what sorts of perspectives um, do we include in that analysis. Um, I'm going to just quickly throw it to Brenton, uh, who's been sort of eyeing the chat and the working document to see uh, whether there's particular things we should pick up on, on the dis in the discussion. Uh, Brenton, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. And, and I realized that how off-putting it is when you throw to me that quickly as I did it to you last week. So that's only fair. <laughs> um, I want you, I I want you like five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
Um, I've, I've been following the chat quite closely, the, the written um, document a little less. Um, and I've, I've, I've been sort of trying to actually just engage on, on there. I guess, um, so I think, that, I mean, Pirit's question, I think is a really interesting one. Um, you know, how do we, you know, take this, this moment um, from uh, something that was being forced upon us to actually developing new muscles um, that actually becomes part of the institutional infrastructure um, rather than sort of uh, something that we, we do in a, in a, in a sort of a, you know, in a hurry. Um, I did put a, put a link up there as well. Um, that I think Julio, you shared a couple of days ago about um, the need for a new sort of Bretton Woods style conversation. And I, and I guess to linking that to, to, to Miko's point, how do we start to influence those sorts of conversations that are gonna be happening over the next, you know, year, two years, three years to sort of be, lead some of this um, muscle memory that we're building into the, the sort of governance infrastructure. Um, so those are sort of some of the things that are, occurred to me. Um, I guess there's a lot of questions about um, what good policy experimentation uh, looks like. Um, I mean, I think we've heard some, some good examples uh, of this on the way through. Um, I'm just seeing if there's anything else on the other document that I needed to pull up. Uh, which, um, no, I'm going to leave it there. Okay. Um, maybe in length of that, uh, we can pick up on, um, uh, there was a question around, uh, well, when you talk about institutionalization, so Simone is, is asking about the United Nations role uh, changing in terms of, of legitimacy as well. Um, so a, a little bit kind of in length of uh, talking about governments, what are the, well, the broader institutional implications of what should they be? Uh, and for example, like organizations like the UNDP is, is are you guys stepping up in a very different way currently? Um, and, and what do you think lies ahead of you? Julia, do you want to pick up on that one? Oh, that's a tough one. I, I certainly cannot speak on, you know, on behalf of a whole of UNDP. I can tell you for sure it's fairly unprecedented times for us as well. Uh, I mean, I think the bigger picture, I mean, you probably see in every day, right? There is a major debates about international system at this point in time. Uh, positive, negative, has it worked well, has it not worked well, uh, what has been the response, uh, you've seen some agencies being singled out, right, you've seen different type of uh, feelings about whether, you know, we are either at the beginning of a new multilateralism and the article that Brenda was sharing about, uh, you know, the need for a new Bretton Woods, right, uh, and the opposite, the apocalyptic saying, no, we say we're going to retrench in an area of even more nationalism, supply chain pulled back. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, you might have seen it, but there's a couple of countries that have put, put out um, stimulus packages under the condition that some of our uh, companies are repatriate, re right? So that type of thing, right? So the consequences of all of this are just too early to tell. Uh, I think everybody brings more or less their own agenda to this particular perspective at this point in time, at least seems to me my impression. Well, I can tell you, at least from, from, from our side, there's definitely an unprecedented level of uh, mobilization, soul searching, uh, questioning, activity, all of this all at once. Because I think the deep sense is really that this has been something we have, uh, you know, we, first of all, we haven't in any way foreseen. And secondly, uh, we really don't. You know, it seems to be a once in a lifetime type of experience and we don't really generally know how best to go about it. So we are trying to learn as fast as we can as well. Thank you. That's great. Nico, did you want to have the final word? I know you're leaving in a couple of minutes. Uh, I want to give you some space to, uh, to maybe a final comment. Yeah, um, uh, so I, I think um, in response to one of the questions, which was uh, what could be the uh, kind of uh, ideal experimentation, government experimentation, policy experimentation. I think we we have a lot of that technical understanding at place already. I mean, uh, I see that in the attendee list, there is Albert Bravo Pioska from, from Nesta, and there are many others who have been doing this in practice for a long time. 
the problem has been that governments haven't been linking experimentation to the core activities that they have basically meaning the legislation process and the and the uh, policy making process so um maybe i'm already a bit repeating myself but this is the big question of this time uh, many of the reforms that have been successful in governments if you take for example the uh, the Estonian di digital government framework um, that was basically uh, in my, my interpretation has been that it was pretty much inspired by uh, a narrative that was going around a resource scarcity uh, everybody in government from the politicians to strategic level to the very on the ground workers knew that there was uh, resources lacking and digitalization back then was shown as, uh, as something that could respond to this challenge it might be not the most kind of beautiful story that you have but in in terms of mechanics of anatomics of this type of reforms it's really interesting if you look at it you need something that is kind of drawing you into a certain direction and everybody is aligned with that so this is my kind of hunch that this COVID-19 might be that kind of thing um, and now if the government start interpreting it so that you for example start saying that this is not uh, this is not only one case we need agility we need experimentation then i think the implementation side how we actually do things they we actually have as experts uh, we have quite a lot of that already that knowledge already existing so we would need that momentum and this knowledge to now come together i hope that happens but thank you i want to also say that thank you for inviting me i unfortunately have to jump into the next call already now but uh, Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Mika. Uh, see you later. Thanks so much. Um, so, yeah, maybe just picking up on that that comment from Mika, um, uh, and picking up on a, a couple of, of points uh, also in the chat. Um, Hefin, you talked about unintentional uh, experimentation. Uh, Julio, you you had a slightly different uh, sort of word for it. Um, uh, you know, when you talked about this sort of relations between quick fix and, and portfolios, like on one end of the, or two ends of the spectrum. Um, so we, I guess we in our work usually talk about experimentation as a way of accelerating learning. And this is obviously something inspired by, by you, Julio, as well, uh, when we work together. Um, uh, and I wonder, and you talked about as well, the, the sort of the institutional memory side of this, uh, how are we doing when it comes to capturing the, the lessons learned? And I guess more importantly, uh, how, how are you seeing those kind of being a part of the, the kind of strategic government decision-making um, when it comes to the prioritizations? Um, I guess, you know, uh, there's a bit of a consideration around, um, at, part, at times this feels like a slightly random kind of, at least in the Danish context where I sit, it feels slightly random what comes up as important every other week or every other day, um, as opposed to being being a part of a strategic plan. And one of the political um, conversations right now where the critique from the opposition is that it is not strategic enough, that we are not linking the data uh, well enough to decision making. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering like what the implications of this unintentional and unintentional experimentation agenda is um, uh, and whether you have more thoughts on that and, and what that means going forward. You always give me the tough questions, Jasper. Yeah, uh, that's why uh, I'm here. Right. Um, okay, so a couple of things. So the first thing is, uh, you know, some level of experimentation happens all the time, right? So it's just never acknowledged, recognized, etc. Uh, this particular moment in crisis, this level of acceleration causes the learning potentially to go exponentially. The question, however, is uh, you learn if you do something, you reflect on it, and then you decide to do things differently because of insight you got from your action, right? Uh, to oversimplify it. Uh, I am not sure that people at this point in time have any time to reflect who are working on the front line at least, right? So maybe other parts of government that have some breathing space, not many. Uh, but the question is then if you take that the time of reflection is not 
uh, available is there any way that you can capture in some ways the raw material of what is happening right so this is if you remember that article was circulated to the states of change list right so you should send your innovation team on the front line to capture novel practices right because they will have some time to reflect they will have a luxury to capture some of these things but then the question is who has learned right certainly people on the front line people who are implementing certainly have learned but has the organizational overall learned from this type of experimentation and what do you actually need to put in place so that the learning that comes from the trenches is passed on to others and again you know unfortunately at least in our cases the way we typically do it is post-mortem to produce case studies lessons learned etc and which are typically not useful at all if you are a practitioner right they're very polished they're extremely uh, you know, they don't really capture the dilemmas, the decisions, the heat of the moment, the competing pressures, whatever else, etc. cetera. Uh, and so the, the really interesting question is how do you go cap about capturing some of these things? So for me, we, re we just don't have a modality that is really geared to capture some of these raw materials, the contradictions, and then generates discussions across different level of government to say, what do we actually make out of this? What happened? How do we make sense of all of this? Uh, what are the discussion we should be having from these signals that we pick up from the front line and trying to then uh, generate a different type of discussion so that the view that the person at the very top has and the view of the people that are on the front line are somewhat angled, right? And they're not two parallel worlds that don't seem to be talking to each other. How to make that happen? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. As I told you, we are trying to make a very, very small experiment, right? So I know that there are other organizations that are trying to do big scale experiments on digital ethnography on this one at the moment. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I haven't quite cracked it yet. So I'm not sure I'm answering your question. I have more questions than answers, but this is what we are grappling with. Thanks, Julio. That's great. Evan? I think, I think that if, um governments are not intentional about the experiments that they are doing or the hypothesis they are trying to test, then it's unclear um, where is the future we are heading to. Like, what do people want in the future and how do these things help us create the society that we want or what is the purpose of government or what do we want the role of government to be? So if we are not intentional about it, then we may not um, get to a future that we like or, and that we want. Great, excellent. Um, we have a couple of more minutes. Uh, I, at this point, I just wanna open the floor to anyone that wants to say something, ask something. Uh, I, I know we haven't touched on all the questions you've added, so. Uh, you might have others, so uh, please jump in uh, at this point if you have any thoughts, questions. Otherwise, I will keep talking, which I'm happy to. Yes, but maybe if I can jump in. Um, sure. Uh, and it's just maybe just a, a sort of a, a thought that I haven't really sort of heard talked about in this context, we've talked about it in other contexts, which is about um, how we make room for the new um, and the sort of the art of decommissioning um, or the art of exit, um, as the Nestor report written on this many years ago by Laura Bunn. Um, you know, we've, we've often sort of, often the challenge for innovation has been sort of trying to sort of carve out space for new uh, and, and, and the way that they tried to do that is to sort of identify um, you know, what may no longer be serving us and finding a way to sort of, um, uh, with sort of respect and dignity, sort of decommission the things that are no longer serving us. I think we probably ought to revisit that conversation as well, because I think there'll be a number of things that will probably be um, quite uh, um, uh, redundant by the, the sort of the new reality we face ourselves in, in sort of, you know, the next six, 12 months. So having processes of, of actually recognizing that because we're going to have to use all of our resources very carefully. Um, so those that are decommissioning processes, I think are probably going to be something we need to pay, pay attention to again. Thanks, Brenton. I'll 
try with the silence a little bit, see if others want to jump in. Otherwise, I'll, I'll pick it up. Um, I, I would love to sort of talk to a question that I wrote in the chat earlier, Thank you. Um, if that's right, just around how this crisis is affecting our sort of people facing the biggest challenges uh, even more than most of us. And I just wondered if anyone of the speakers had any comments about how they've seen their governments um, experimenting to try to level the playing field and build more equity in their communities um, and, and experimenting in a way that might sustain, um, as we know, those inequities exist all the time. Any thoughts, Stephen, Julio? It's a tough question. An area where we've seen an awful lot of experimentation is uh, health, and particularly telehealth, um, and being able to provide services to people who don't have access to it. Now, obviously, digital is also a divide, right, in itself. Uh, but if you consider that, at least in some countries in Asia, telemedicine was next to yeah, well, not really illegal, but certainly not encouraged in some places. Uh, and overnight, you've seen countries like Indonesia or even Bangladesh uh, creating massive uh, telemedicine, telehealth services, using all the means at their disposal uh, to actually being able to reach out to people in a different way. Uh, obviously, that still leaves out any people who do not have access to uh, digital means. Uh, but that has significantly and dramatically uh, expanded the reach of health services, right? Now, then obviously the question about quality and all these other things will be raised. Uh, but in terms of actually dramatically expanding and creating almost overnight a new set of public services, uh, I think that has been a fairly dramatic type of response. Uh, a more really difficult question uh, regards areas around urban planning, for example, right? So slums, uh, refugee camps. Uh, this has been something where I haven't really seen uh, much uh, significant innovation in terms of intervention. It doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. I just, uh, you know, haven't really seen it. And in fact, I've seen some fairly worrying movements in some parts of, of, of the region. So I think to me, this remains one big question. And generally speaking, around urban planning also moving forward beyond the crisis in terms of how we reach our most vulnerable, that would be a really important one. Um, the final thing is, I think, the, the question around experimenting uh, with data to try to reach the most vulnerable is certainly on top of the mind of most governments. But this is something that certainly predates uh, COVID. Uh, and there has been some movements in some areas uh, and try to, 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 you know, to release new sets of data, new data collaborations that were not possible before. But I think we are a really long way to go there if we talk about being more targeted in reaching the most vulnerable, particularly in the informal sector. I think for Singapore, we have seen the government um, giving cash payouts to the more vulnerable groups, it's quite rare. The Singapore government tends to be very careful about giving direct cash payouts. They rather tie it to jobs or training and things like that. So this was kind of a long held policy parameter that they removed in this period. Um, with a uh, sort of a lockdown that they refuse to call a lockdown. We call it a circuit breaker in Singapore. Mm, children are required to stay at home and a lot of low income homes don't have computers. So I've seen a government program getting computers out to these children as well as a lot of community groups um, getting refurbished laptops out to them. I also thought it was interesting how um, we assure migrant workers directly that they will be paid even during a lockdown, even though their companies may not be doing well. There was public commitment that they will be paid, they will be fed, 
and the government will pay for all their medical expenses. So they have sent medical teams um, to dormitories and right from the start, the government um, told the population, everyone that um, all COVID related treatment will be paid by the government. So I think a lot of these interventions are done in this period for local as well as migrant communities. Um, I'm just unsure whether how it would change um, post crisis. Excellent. Thanks for that question, Lucy, and thanks for the responses, Heaven and, and Julio. So uh, we're almost out of time. Um, one final thought just for me on, on that is there's certainly a, a debate happening or occurring now in my, my part of the world, which is sort of uh, to your point, Heaven, in the beginning, talking about the transactional economy, uh, you know, the service and consumption led economy essentially uh, kind of being on a halt and and sort of exposing almost the absurdity of, of our way of living and, and what we rely on. Uh, and obviously also exposing the, the what is then essential, which is, you know, uh, the, a lot of our frontline workers. Um, so whether that's kind of sticking as a, as a value change uh, will be interesting to see and, 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 and to follow uh, along. I want to thank everyone for joining the conversation. <clears throat> Excuse me, I want to particularly thank Heaven, Miko, and Julio for sharing their inspiring and insightful thoughts and experiences. Uh, it's been a great conversation, uh, and we're looking forward to the next one. Uh, so it'll be next week. Look out for the details around that. Maybe Brenton already shared it in the chat, I believe, but we will be sharing, uh, sharing that on Twitter and in our newsletter as well. Uh, so to continue the conversation there, and we'll be picking up questions from this week as well. So, but for now, thank you and uh, see you next time. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Yep. Likewise, nice. thank you. Good conversation. It was really good to hear um, 